Good afternoon and welcome to Site Match 365, brought to you today by transport consultant Vectos and Be First, the development company owned by Barking and Dagnum Council. My name is Toby Fox and I'm the Managing Director at FreeFox, the marketing agency for councils. Uh, since lockdown began, we've been providing digital channels to help keep our network of councils and developers and investors and their advisors connected. And I'm back tomorrow on our sister channel, The Voice of Authority, at 11 a.m. with architect Pitman Tozer and guests from TfL, uh, from Brent and from Merton councils to look at four case studies of unlocking railway land for new homes. And you can register for that at thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. But we're here today on Sitematch365, our channel for place-based discussion. Uh, and that discussion today is about Barking and Dagenham as a case study of how our suburbs are evolving in ways accelerated by the pandemic. In a piece of BBC research into the future of workplaces, the CEO of Slack, Stuart Butterfield, said that only 12% of knowledge workers want to return full time to office work and 72% want a hybrid remote office model moving forward. Uh, he said, we all know that work will never be the same, even if we don't yet know all the ways in which it will be different. And as for home, a recent McKinsey report claimed that post pandemic over 70% of US consumers intend to continue at home habits for fitness, for entertainment, and for something called self care. And the high street, the high streets task force noted that from March to June, district centers saw footfall drop by 34.5% compared to 75.9% in cities. And its research in Australia noted that there are clear signs of a resurgence in local shopping villages and high street retailing. There even appears to be a corner store revival of sorts. Major questions are being raised about the future character and function of the CBD and ultimately about the structure of Australian cities. And the same must be true in the UK, or is it? Well, Be First think so. They contend that the suburb is entering a renaissance, that the slump in people commuting into cities and TfL in September reported commuting at 35% of pre-pandemic levels is going to endure. And that with people working from home, homes will have to change and local high streets will be repurposed and revitalized and that infrastructure is gonna be redirected and that these changes will create new opportunities and require new responses from Be First developer and designer partners. So what are those opportunities and responses? Well, to quote Butterfield again, and himself quoting the philosopher Yogi Barra, uh, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Nonetheless, that's what we're going to try to do. But we're not gonna do it alone, viewers. We've enlisted some uh, excellent brains to help us, and it's a pleasure to welcome this afternoon, in alphabetical order, Mike Axon, who is director at Vectos, uh, Tom Bloxham, MBE, the chairman of Urban Splash, uh, Kyle De Bruin, development director at Leesman, Pat Hayes, the managing director at Be First, and Rachel Rapp, the associate director and co-lead Crowd Signs at Crowd DNA. And these brilliant people are going to share their experience and their insights through a conversation with you, viewers. And that conversation is going to revolve around four questions. How have lifestyles actually changed and what changes are going to endure? How will changing lifestyles affect what the future suburban neighbourhoods are going to look like? How will infrastructure evolve to support and to encourage those changes? And what development and growth opportunities are emerging? We're going to be asking those panellists to respond to those questions and to each other and to your own questions and comments, which we encourage you to share via the Q&A and chat functions on your screens. We'll also post a few snap polls to you so that your opinions can fuel the discussion. OK, let's get that discussion going. Uh, and we're going to do that by putting the first question to Rachel and first to Kyle. Kyle, um, how have lifestyles actually changed and, and what changes will endure? Yeah, thanks, Toby. Um, so at Leesman, we've been measuring offices for the past 10 years. And this year, obviously, we had to shift uh, gears somewhat. And we've been measuring uh, home working environments uh, via an independent survey tool. Um, so we're now in a unique position to sort of understand um, really what's happening within homes and offices. And we effectively have the, a huge database, over a million respondents to our sur two survey tools, um, which, which understand the relationship relationship between these in some detail. So I'll just give you some of the, the highlights of the data just to understand um, what we're seeing really from, from 2020. 
the vast majority of, um, of, of home working is really working well for employees. Um, so as an average, uh, our home uh, Leesman index score is sitting at 74, for example, and our, our global office average is sitting at 63.5 roughly. So it's about a you know, 10 to 15% increase there, depending on how you look at it. Um, so the majority of ac activities that employees are doing at home are actually better supported at home in a lot of cases than, than in the office. So um, things like uh, activities that require acoustic privacy, for example, right, conversations, private conversations, those types of things are managed or are handled very well from, from the home environment and individual focus type work activities. So, um, you know, being able to concentrate and get on with your individual work. So the home is performing very well in a lot of ways. However, it's, it's important to note that roughly one in four or one in five employees are having a, a suboptimal uh, experience at home. So they are struggling from the home environment. Um, and I think there's a few factors to that. The main driver of poor performance in, in people working from their homes is really, um, um, uh, the work setting that you're working from. So are you sitting on a sofa or a kitchen table or do you have your own office or, or you know, uh, a private environment to actually do that work from? Um, and that's really driving, uh, driving performance. And there's some very interesting correlations we're seeing in the data between homework setting and things like um, you know, your connectivity to your organization and colleagues, for example, uh, there's, there's correlations between that. Um, your work-life balance is, is affected by that as well. And then obviously things like your productivity. So right now, the conversation we're having with, you know, a lot of our clients is trying to, is trying to figure out this blended landscape of, of homeworking, um, uh, you know, really understanding what, what, their, um, what type of offices they need to provide their staff and, and what sort of balance they have between homework and office. And also the third space, which I think is quite topical for this conversation, like what other options do you have outside of the home near your, near your home that you may choose to, to do work from? Um, so, you know, as far as behaviors go, you know, em employees have been given trust, autonomy and choice this year. Um, and, you know, it's going to be tricky or probably impossible to, to just completely reverse that. So behaviors have shifted now and it would be probably unwise to try and undo that and bring everyone back to the office full time. Um, you know, the, the, the competition for talent, um, you know, is, is going to be including, uh, you know, giving, giving employees free, this freedom and choice. So it's going to be part of the, the, the sort of building blocks of, of corporations going forward. Um, and that goes the other way around as well. We don't, we don't expect a complete shift. It's not a binary discussion because if you think about the younger demographics and we see this in the data as well, they're, they're, they're going to be expecting knowledge transfer in, in the office, right? Uh, they're not just going to want to join companies and just, just work from home full time, for example. And they, they're going to be seeking the, the social aspect of, of, of the office as well. Um, so we don't see as much downsizing of, of sort of corporate real estate potentially as you, as you may read in the general media. Um, but we certainly see more utilization of, of home and third space going into the future. Fantastic, Carl. Thanks very much. And that, that, that's really interesting, that one in four um, that are struggling and the fact that it's the design of the home that, that, that's, that's really affecting that. We'll, we'll, we'll put that to Tom shortly. Um, Rachel, are there any thoughts that you'd like to, to add to that? Yeah, actually lots that I think I can pick up on. I'm just going to share my screen because I have some slides to kind of accompany what um, I'd like to share. But um, I think what Carl was talking about with this blend of spaces and potentially the third space really picks up on this big shift that we've been thinking about at Crowd DNA around the idea of a more, more fluid future. And this big pause that 2020 has presented us with has created this deceleration of culture, but that's actually accelerated certain trends. So everything's been coming, becoming more flexible, not just flexible working, but you know, we've seen our homes go from being sanctuaries or places of rest to being these hubs of everything we do. We've seen our communities go from being a kind of social pleasure that we might associate with physical locations or venues to being a very necessary point of human connection um, and very much fluid in the spaces that they inhabit. So we think of our communities being online now or being on Zoom like, like we are today. Um, and then we also think of this kind of fluid tension between the fact that we are craving more kind of space and nature um, and outside living, which maybe is at odds with that more, uh, the more traditional aspirational movement towards cities and kind of fast paced living. Um, and then within that more fluid landscape, there are four cultural shifts or lifestyle changes that we really um, see enduring. And, and this builds on what Carl was saying. Um, but the first one, which is less about working from home or working scenarios is this move from kind of globalism to micro 
Localism, we obviously saw kind of shop small movements growing before COVID, but now we see this quite protectionist mindset about supporting our nearest and dearest, supporting local bars, local uh, restaurants when we can, local shops. Um, and it's about celebrating and championing the local, but also, you know, shutting um, ourselves in and keeping that bubble protected. Um, you talked a bit at the beginning, Toby, about self-care. And I think there's been a massive shift towards the idea of wellness or self-care being kind of quite a privileged or luxury pastime to now being quite essential to us as individuals. So this kind of sees that convergence of protectionism and individualism. We're looking to make our homes safer, whether that's through bringing in more cleaning products or even plants to clean our air, um, making them feel closer to nature again to give that feeling of space. Um, and then hedonism has shapeshifted and the home has played a big part in that too. Um, we've seen our homes become these really experiential environments. So the, yes, they're places that we work. Yes, they're places that we exercise, but they're also places that we're learning to socialize from or kind of entertain ourselves in. Um, when we're not able to express ourselves externally or go to bars and parties, then we have to move that inward. And we can see a future happening where homes become much more multi-sensory and kind of more stimulating in their environment. And then the final enduring shift, well, not final, there's obviously a lot that plays into this, but the kind of significant um, remaining shift that I want to talk about was this renewed empathy for people and planet. We saw a kind of slow burning value shift building prior to COVID that's been accelerated in this decelerated time. Um, we've had more time to reflect, as I've talked about, we've gone inwards and we've been exposed, exposed and um, to kind of global causes. We've been connecting digitally with those, especially we, when we can't travel and especially the younger generation, whether that be thinking about climate or race, um, the inequality of lockdowns and the kind of um, inequities that exposes but it's kind of propelled this um, movement towards empathy and looking at how we can create kind of fairer living conditions and embed more ethical practices into our everyday lives. So it's been a real period of um, causes and purpose. Fantastic. That's that's terrific. Thank you very much. Great introductions. Um, so, so Mike, have, have we seen um, a, a real, real changes to, to people's lifestyles in terms of the travel and, and the transport options that they're going for as well? Oh, yes, without a doubt. I mean, through COVID, we've seen what, I mean, even at certain times, tenfold increase in cycling in London, for instance, at certain times. Um, but, but as Kyle and Rachel were saying earlier, it, it's really the, the longer lasting changes that are most interesting. And we believe that what we are seeing now are changes that are going to stick to a certain degree. Probably changes that will bring us a little bit further towards if, if you like the sort of planet empathy point that Rachel was just talking about, climate reduction, carbon reduction, uh, cl cl carbon reduction emissions, um, uh, and things that actually we might want to see in any event. We've, we've probably accelerated five or ten years the trends that already existed. Thanks, Mike. So, 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 Tom, when you're when you're when you're looking at at, at, um, at how at the future residents of, of your homes, what are the changes that you're seeing that, that are enduring that you're having to build into your your plans? I mean, to be honest with you, we've always been focused on um, we call it live well by design on actually looking after people, thinking how design and housing can um, appeal to more people. But what we found during the pandemic is many things we've always been doing have been increasingly popular. Uh, for instance, our treatment of public space and communal space. And, you know, for instance, the development behind me on each of our schemes now, we're trying to put a hierarchy of space. So each apartment or house has got some private space, a terrace in this area or balcony, some communal space, a communal garden, which you share with your neighbours so the kids can play out and also public space. And typically we build public parks as a first phase of any development. And actually, in the past, people have sort of said, what are you doing that for? Nobody wants it. Nobody's going to pay for it. The value is will just value your thousand three square foot three bedroom house the same as the next door one. But I think we're really seeing now people appreciating and voting with their feet, as well as their wallets, for developers who do provide a better home, a better designed home. Yeah, so, so Mike's five to 10 year acceleration is, um, is, is um, uh, benefiting your business plans considerably in, in, in that instance. Um, Pat, we, we just heard from, from Rachel about a, a shift towards more fairness, um, more, more empathy. 
Um, is this something that you're seeing in, in Barking and Dagenham amongst amongst residents um, in, in your borough? And, and do you think which of these changes do you think is going to endure? Is, is that in particular going to endure? Um, I think that might be the one that that endures least because of other and ongoing economic pressures. I mean, I think that um, definitely the move to to greater home working, I think that will endure. I mean, it's not the death of the office by any stretch of the imagination for the reasons that were said before, but I think the amount of time that people spend in the office will definitely be less. I think people's travel patterns will definitely change in terms of, um, you know, I think some people will move out of London. I think a lot of people will want to spend, as we're already seeing, more time in the suburbs, because it's interesting during the, the first period of lockdown, you go to central London, deserted, um, outer London small previously struggling shopping centres packed with people actually and a lot of people out and about and I think that's the the opportunity that is there in some ways that people stop wanting to go into central London I think major sustainability questions as well in terms of both travel distance and I think in terms of that people wanting to be more responsible I think people are now realising yes you don't have to spend all that time effort money carbon travelling um also, you know, if you think about it, these huge monoliths that are now sitting there in central London, the sort of, you know, the, almost the macho office development of the last 20 or 30 years, you know, my tower's bigger than your tower, um, my atrium's bigger than your atrium, you know, now sitting there empty. And a lot of people thinking, do we really need that much space? Yes, we would always have an office in central London, but you know, are the, you know, and you're already seeing it in terms of when lockdown first started I think we were quite worried about what happened in the Barking Enterprise Centre which is workspace effectively you know all their existing tenants kept their their leases on and they've got a full sort of waiting list in terms of people wanting to work from that space coming back to Tom's point there's an interesting thing for us as a housing developer is you know do we think well yeah you know we're building to very high specification and quality anyway um do you build places which are better for people to work in? Or do you, in terms of those ground floor interactive uses, do you create more workspace as part of a development? So rather than people working at home, you work in proximity to home, which may get around one of our traditional problems in terms of you know, places where everybody worked being dead during the day because everyone had trekked off into town. And because of the nature of the long commute, people tend to do their shopping in town, come back, and, and go straight to their flat, you know. So I think real opportunity that actually people say, no, I don't want to spend all that time commuting. Yes, I want to work in a social place. For us as a developer, should we be building you know, more, you know, rather than live workspace, more workspace in proximity to places where people live and in suburban town centres? And is this a way that we can recreate that suburban town centre? You know, Lots of um, corporate head offices used to be in suburban London, places like Harrow, Barking, you know, a few still remain, but not that many actually now. Is this an opportunity to revitalise that? And will people want somewhere they can go into London, but not all the way into London? You know, so you know, some of this will endure, some of it won't. I, uh, I'll, I'll come uh, back to that um, very shortly when we when we move on to looking at the at the shape of the suburbs. But I just want to pick up something with um, with Carl and, and first Rachel. Um, there, there are two things in that. One, um, this idea that people don't go into London anymore. And the reports I'm getting back, I haven't been into central London for for ages. But the reports I'm getting back are that it is rammed. That Oxford Street is rammed. That that central London is absolutely overflowing with people because it's a tourist and shopping destination, not because people are going back to work. I mean, is that something? Something that'll endure is it, it does it become something uh, london's the city centers are places you visit at the weekends but during the week you stay at home and then the idea of fairness and empathy um it, 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 maybe there's more empathy for the planet and maybe maybe the idea of, of, of fairness to, to your fellow man is is, is not going to endure because of, of some harsh economic conditions that are going to come in but i've noticed amongst employers that there's a real shift into trying desperately to understand how their employees and co-workers are getting on because Without that immediate contact, it's really hard to know who's struggling and who isn't. So, Rachel, could you pick up on either of those? Yeah, the first point about um, lots of people still going into central London, I think obviously it's Christmas, so there's a slight pinch of salt with that one there. But I think if this, if the change to more local um, or championing more local is going to endure, then I think people will still want to go out shopping. It's just the ability to do that on your doorstep or near nearby will be more attractive than going into um, 
shop in the biggest shopping centers or at big brands. And I think if we're, if we're looking further in the future and how young people are going to, to move forward, and I'll probably reference what's happening with youth a bit more in this webinar, because that's how we tend to like look at the trend trajectory, um, is that they are very much into independent brands and supporting kind of smaller labels and things like that. So they, if they can see suburbs developing outside city centers, which have quite exciting and dynamic brands that might not necessarily get in the city or even in another suburb, that's gonna be really attractive. Um, so I can see that being a kind of scenario that might play out. Um, and in terms of the empathy and um, kind of fairness point, again, I think that's something that will grow with youth. I think, I think young people are looking for brands, they hold brands to same high standards as they do themselves. They're looking for quite human brands to connect to. And therefore they're looking for kind of authenticity and empathy and brands that care about them. And I imagine the same will come when they're looking at places to live. They want to feel, they want to be able to connect on an emotional level. They want, they want a service and practicality from a brand or from a corporation, because of course you're, you're paying for a service or a product, but it has to have a bit more beyond that. So if it's thinking about place, places where they want to live, they're going to know, want to know what does it feel like to live in that suburb, not just what's the spec of the building. Um, so yeah. I think that will be an interesting evolution of that. Thanks, Rachel. Carl, is any, anything you want to pick up on, on, on that? And in, in particular, how, how are people actually feeling about other people? You know, are we are we becoming more isolated and do we want to become more isolated? Or do you think people feel that they want to be closer to other people and, and get back in touch? Yeah, I think just to just to add to the point about maybe London is a bit busy around Christmas time, perhaps, but I think we're speaking to the clients that I do with 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 offices all around the world and in London. Um, the, the occupancy rates are super low. I mean, you know, below five, you know, five percent building up to 20 percent, perhaps. So there's a lot there's a lot less people in, in the city center for sure. Um, you know, from a from a, uh, you know, empathy, well-being aspect. I mean, we're we're having a lot more engagement when, in our discussions, normally with corporate real estate sort of functions and HR is, HR is now very much involved in the discussion. So there's a lot of looking at employees and understanding that, that sort of, you know, how are they doing uh, question that, that, that you sort of posed. Um, so there, there's a, definitely a bigger focus on that. And there's certain aspects which we ask in our survey around connectivity to organization, connectivity to your colleagues. And I think this is, these are the weak points right now that are, that are being experienced. So I think the general consensus that we're feel, feeling and hearing is that people do want to get back to the office, you know, probably a lot more than maybe, maybe the, the numbers would tell you perhaps, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, home working does work very well, but there's, even though it's, it seems relatively small aspects of, of the bigger picture, there's, there's a definite um, desire for, for having that human connectivity, especially you know, in, in those office environments. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Carl. Now, so so um, Carl's million people uh, survey tells us that that people do want to 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 be in human contact with other people. They want to work relatively close to other people physically. Rachel, uh, what 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 are the suburbs actually going to start looking like if that's if that's the case? Are are, are they going to be populated uh, as as Pat suggested with uh, with people nine to five Monday to Friday uh, working and 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 living uh, in, in in the same sort of spaces? Um. Well, from a sort of demographic point of view, I guess it depends who chooses to live there. I think there's going to be, I, I think I'd like to link back to what Pat said earlier about having more working space, spaces close to where you live and not necessarily the other way around. I think we can imagine a future where suburbs have more of the co-working spaces that you might typically associate with city centres. This idea that you can drop in and out the same way that we see, you know, when, um, gentrification happens, you typically see more coffee shops pop up. And I don't think that necessarily coffee shops and co-working spaces popping up is gonna be just a sign of gentrification. It's a sign of fluidity and more fluid working. Um, and I can't talk about how the suburbs would look necessarily from a physical development point of view, but I think they are definitely undergoing a bit of an image revamp in terms of the fact that um, if they offer a slightly more holistic slower paced life to city centers where you can also work that is actually more aspirational now than that kind of uh being in the rat race being in the center of things in the city so ways any kind of developments or ways that um suburbs can facilitate that will be welcome um 
it's not, it's no longer the kind of place, what, you know, we also associate suburbs with success and actually almost seeming like once you've achieved success, then you move to the suburbs. But if they could still nurture that success and nurture kind of working hubs near to this more holistic way of living, I think they'll be really attractive, um, especially to younger generations growing up. Thanks, Rachel. So, so Tom, um, you, you you talked a bit about the uh, the houses you're already designing, uh, about the work that Urban Splash is already doing. Uh, how much do you think that work might might be changing? There's a there's a question from um, from the viewer Robert Purton. He's he's saying that uh, modern homes are small or open plan and not designed for people working and children schooling at the same time. Um, is it, it, you know that's clearly that's causing some stress. How are the house types of the future going to improve wellness or or, or alter be altered? To to improve wellness what what are your how are your designs changing tom i think it's a really good question and i think we're seeing the whole focus on well-being typically in these conferences when you're talking about residential people talk about residential units and they're talking often about single aspect flats in big blocks and the um, game has been to squeeze in as many possible apartments in the smallest amount of space to get the highest density and buildings designed by accountants on spreadsheets rather than thinking about how people want to live. And we're not building units, we're people building people's homes. And the quality of those homes will affect them for you know years and years. And it's all the more so, I think, recently. Because there's one thing, if you're out all day, you simply come home to your flat to sleep. There's another thing, actually, if you're there the whole time. But actually, all our homes should be great. All our homes should be joys to visit and come to. And the other growing thing that we believe is a personalization. And so why is it when you buy a car today, you actually go on the internet and you bespoke it, you personalize it. Do you want a convertible? Do you want a state? What color do you want to? What finishes? What engine size? And yet on most homes, we can't do that. And so we've developed a configurator. And so again, for our um, homes, people can design every one customized. Do they want it all open plan? Do they want five bedrooms? Do they want two bedrooms? Do they want it cellular? Do they want the kitchen on the top floor with the views? Do they want the kitchen on the bottom floor with a relationship with the garden? So you pay your money, you take your choice. And I think we're going to see much more of that and much more of configurators coming into the housing business in the same way as got into the car business. Does your configurator include workspace? Can, can, you, can, you, can you turn the sort of part of the house into an office? Of course, I mean, you can use a space for whatever you want and it's um, you know, effectively all the structures in the outside of the walls. And so it becomes infinitely flexible um, to use the spaces for um, workspace, studios, uh, bedrooms, um, living rooms, uh, as you wish, work rooms. So, so Pat, how does that affect you? I mean, just from a planning point of view, if, 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 if the home becomes infinitely flexible, how, how does that affect your vision of, of how Barking and Dagenham develops? I don't think it does actually, because uh, this is very much where we're going, certainly as uh, the, the council's own housing developer, you know, we are building to that in a very high space standard and you know, not doing this sort of single aspect, um, sort of almost semi-dormitory type flats, because our flats are being, you know, they're configured for people to live in with families predominantly, um, not just be somewhere where you, you know, get home at 11 o'clock at night, fall asleep and get home, get up again at six and, and go back into the city. So, you know, and some of what Tom's doing, you know, we're doing possibly on a more modest scale in terms of, you know, thinking about the place and the nature and the design so that people have got good relationship with the open space, good relationship with a garden, a decent sized balcony, all these sort of things that makes a, that makes a decent home. And I think that that is really important. And it is part of this, this change that, you know, I've noticed it certainly with my, my stuff and it very much, I think, chimes with what was said earlier in terms of the people who have struggled working from home with those people who've been living in often quite central London you know the dense modern apartment which you know we're very much trying to come up with that you know a relatively high density but not particularly high rise form of development which you know is a development for the for the 21st century and so you can actually call home rather than just a a place to sleep you know and I think that is very important and people are going to ask for more more of that I think we've got to think about yeah, not lose sight of space standards, you know, which has been one of these constant compromises, not lose sight of things like, you know, the importance of where, you know, as many dual aspect homes as you can um, manage, you know, the odd one, you know, which isn't just fitted in really to make better use and to provide a few smaller houses, for example, you know, so I do think these things are very important for design. And I think what we are both as developers and as planners, we've constantly got to be pushing the quality. I think the other thing that's come out of COVID is about the quality of the public realm and, and open space. 
and particularly in London, that shortage of open space actually. Um, and, you know, very much in terms of new developments, thinking about you know, how can you actually make the public open space and public realm somewhere where people want to dwell, people want to stay, people can spend time, where there's enough space, where there's enough use for competing uses as well. So enough space for kids, teenagers, adults, old people. You know. Can I reality check that? Because uh, mm. we've got a, a viewer, Linda Russell, who, who's making a comment, and, and I experienced this as well. Um, the trashing of green space with litter was a real shocker after the first lockdown, she says. Uh, do you think there's a, a meaningful change in the way open space is valued? And I, I noticed this uh, cycling along canals, that canal side litter just uh, it rocketed uh, uh, during lockdown. And, and I guess it's to do with uh, how people are using space and what space uh, is available to them. But but do, do you really think that that um, that that open space is, is valued? Does it is it valued by the public? I, um, I think it's valued. But again, we've lost as a society that culture of communality and mutual respect. That it, and the whole list sort of littering concept isn't anything to do with the dislike of open space. I mean, I think people who litter, I think they like the open space. What they haven't got is the view that you know they view is well the council has paid to take away the litter, so I will drop my drop my litter rather than you know we're a communitarian society we should all look after each other and I think that was the thing that you noticed you know London fields and everywhere else absolutely covered with Victoria Park covered with debris you know after the sort of bank holiday weekends during lockdown and that's a that's a wider issue for society I think what we need to think about as planners and designers and developers is about you know, the design of that public open space the design of planting so it is robust so it doesn't collect litter easily you know, so there are various things you do that you know in certain places encourage people to congregate in others they don't create clear barriers you know dense planting which is more expensive to put in at the start but you know earns its money back you know the traditional council open space is a is a expanse of grass and tarmac um and the traditional council response to um, grass is just mow it even if the litter's on it you know so you just shred the litter and, and leave it there you know so so i think you know that so that models a lack of concern which is then reflected in, in many ways in this sort of I suppose almost post Thatcherite view, you know, there's no such thing as society, which is you know, deeply ingrained now in, in British society, which is why people drive so badly and everything else. Although, although Rachel has made the point that, that there seems to be a counter trend to that, that there is there is kind of more more empathy uh, amongst people towards both towards the environment and, and, and towards each other. And we, we might come back on, on that point, given what you've just said, Pat. But Mike, um, public open space, what, what, what role does that play in, in the settlement of the future, which uh, which you've excited me with uh, before? I'd just like to start on that point by saying that actually the, the reason people travel and the reason people are, are out in the open isn't, isn't predominantly to go to work. In fact, um, traveling for leisure and undertaking leisure activities is a, is, a, is, a, is a more prevalent activity than actually going to work. And therefore the, the, the provision of open space as an opportunity for people to get some sort of leisure facility and some relaxation is actually important. And what we're seeing is that it's taking on greater importance, particularly as the younger generations come through the, come through the system. So very, very important in terms of suburbs, possibly more important than it's ever been before. OK, excellent. Is there anything else you want to pick up on in, in terms of uh, how neighbourhoods are, are, are evolving? Well, if, if I may, uh, I, I would like to put it in context. I mean, I've got a few slides. I've got about three and a half minutes worth of slides just Go to put it. that in context. Might well add, add one or two other things to what we've just been talking about. So what we've, what we've got here is, is, is this is wonderful because just like magic, um, my slides are being put up on the screen. So what we're saying about this is even in the world before COVID, um, we were seeing this difference in the mindsets between the generations. Uh, and for instance, the millennials, for these people, the internet was really new and shiny. And, and this, they embraced, if you like, the sharing economy. Um, but as these generations come of age, it's these mindsets that, that create the policies of the future. If you just knock on the next slide, Emily. Um, so the past mindsets, the, these have already led to these converging trends, which in this case is less reliance on driving. What we're seeing now, um, even before COVID, but certainly as a result of COVID, is that change is now happening faster than these policies can be rewritten. 
and Rachel alluded to it earlier, for the younger generation, the cause celeb, this is what will shape our policies for the foreseeable future is in fact climate change. To make climate change happen, we need these big plans, not little plans. That's the scale of change that we need to achieve to hit even current targets. And to do that, surface transport is our potential big win. And that's important when it comes to suburbs and commuting. Even though with a pandemic where we saw emissions drop by 30% at its peak, half of which due to surface transport, we're actually off target this year compared with what we need to achieve. In terms of the suburbs and development, we might reasonably expect that we will be doing something about this. So living now is all about accessibility, not mobility. In the simple sense, that is just access to day-to-day -to -day facilities by whatever means, physical or digital. Um, and in our suburbs, what we're starting to see is that actual transport is the third question after can I do it online or can I do it online and get it delivered? Now, in terms of this working life, we've been talking about that quite a lot at the moment. But what, how we see it is that the frame of reference for working life has changed. It's not office good, virtual bad, or the other way around. I think it's as we were saying earlier, the frame of reference is now equal weighting to both. You need to mentor staff, bring junior staff on, also need to give staff the flexibility to have the, the, the sort of home environment and the local living. Um, um, what has actually happened and what's happening now, and what I think will happen in an accelerative mode in the future, is that we're returning our local towns and suburbs to actual local living. And that does not mean that you don't travel somewhere else for other things, but you would expect to see a greater emphasis on local living. And that is how we're designing the developments that we're involved in, particularly new settlements, urban extensions, that sort of thing. So we might expect our future neighbourhoods actually being shaped by this trend. Um, so less road space, for instance, um, more play space. Um, priority to online, online bus deliveries. Uh, and actually in many of our places now, the priority to a primary movement network that's actually an active travel movement network. We expect busier local shops, which is what we talked about earlier, certainly more local living, all of which goes to these lower carbon emissions. And that's a hard target. You know, that's something we should be trying to achieve and we need to try and achieve. And actually, there's no compelling reason not to design for all of that in our new developments. There's no reason not to have this vision. That, that's the background, Toby. Great stuff, Mike. Thank you very much indeed. So, so Rachel, how, how does that look like? Uh, look compared to your vision of, of the of the neighbourhood of the future and, and and the work that Crowd DNA has been doing on this. Yeah, I would say it's it's quite a nice illustration for us <laughs> some of our trends. So, thanks for that, Mike. Um, I think this idea of everything being closer and actually, I just wanted to. Um, reference back to this point around more rubbish in spaces and do we actually value those spaces and it's perhaps not very communal or collective to litter those shared spaces but I think if we think about that empathy point there's also this sense of community perhaps is become, coming through more strongly less so in our societal responsibility more so in the need to connect with people and that littering is often a sign as as you say people being able to meet in public spaces during lockdown sometimes that's been the only places we can socialize um, and I think so I think having those green spaces not only is it important to well-being that feeling that you're nurturing yourself and and I do think that will will last with us all having that kind of fear of the virus in mind you know we want to be as healthy as possible we also want to be near people without it being dangerous. So actually um, open spaces where we can be near people, we can shop locally. It's again, that balance thing of um, being able to move around, but being able to get what you need nearby. And then you can get that excitement from, from traveling further afield. But I think, you know, perhaps it's been clear in the last year how quickly we can adapt to a smaller world. 
and it doesn't mean we don't miss going further afield or miss the excitement of going into the city but um we know what we essentially need is it's quite important that it's easy to access yeah fantastic stuff so so um uh, kyle uh, is uh, is your data telling us anything about about um uh, uh, views towards the suburbs and, and particularly this question about open space that we've been discussing I mean, our, our data is not so focused specifically around this area, but I think what, what we would bring to the conversation is, is thinking about what people need to do, especially um, from, you know, from their job roles, for example. So what do you need to do in your in your day-to-day -day work and how would those environments then support that? So, you know, if you're choosing to work from your home or one of these, you know, um, remote shared offices, flexible working environments, or then choosing to go into the city and striking that balance between, you know, being able to, um, you know, do your job and have that work-life balance as well uh, that, that, that we've been talking about and having, you know, the, the, the choice to be able to um, adapt your your day-to-day -day around those as well. And, and what would your advice to, to Barking and Dagnan be in, in relation to what you're understanding about how people feel about where they want to live? Um, well, I think um, um, uh, Mark, uh, Mark had it earlier in his slides, um, you know, roughly no matter which poll I seem to look at um, as far as um, how many days per week, per week people want to work, it's, it's sitting roughly at two or three per week, right? Um, so, you know, thinking about that, that, that population that's then going to be in, in, in that suburban area rather than in the city centre, and then, you know, what, that, what the sort of infrastructure needs to, to, to support that. I mean, if you look at a company like um, Spaces from, from Regis, right, they've, they've taken a decision at some point pre-COVID to, to set up their remote offices in a lot of sort of commuter belt sort of towns around around London. Um, and I think that's that sort of decision is probably paying off well, or should pay off in the future at some point um, because I think there's going to be a need to, to, to want to work not so much from the home all the time, but have that, that choice of being able to choose another environment nearby, um, you know, that, that, can, that can have you know that decreased um, commuting aspect but also that ability to go somewhere and and be around other people and, and potentially work with with um with your colleagues as well i think that, that's a challenging aspect as well because if you think about a city like london um you know you, you can have employees from your organization potentially coming from all parts of london and, and not not being able to then collaborate with the right type of people to do your work is going to be the challenge so you might end up yeah. having to travel to another you know urban area to um, to um, to actually gain access to the right colleagues to to, to collaborate right so um, so it's it's, a, it's certainly a tricky um, tricky blend or, or um, balance to strike. So so um, Tom, uh, we, we've got uh, viewers making points in in different ways that all kind of um, come come down to the question of how how we design uh, places for for use. You know what what what's the use of a place? Um, it's it seems that from what everyone said so far that the home is no longer just a home. It, it, it's for all sorts of different purposes. But at the same time, as Joe Sargent said, um, the that um, uh, suburban centres are going to need to include business centres, or as Pat said earlier, there's going to need to be working space adjacent to homes or nearby homes uh, for people to make use of. How, how do you go about um, creating a, a, a residential development that, that's going to take into account those different uses? Uh, do you see yourselves as purely providing homes or uh, uh, is your mind now on the kind of the wider uses of that space? Yeah, I mean, Urban Splash are very much mixed use developers and our actual history is in repopulating the empty city centres of Manchester and other northern cities. Um, and it's interesting because you're talking from very much a London-centric focus, uh, clearly, but they got a very successful city centre um, or a very busy city centre, people living in the suburbs. Um, and actually, many other cities have been depopulated over the course of the 20th century, and we've seen a wee population coming in. And so very much our theory has always been about mix of uses, about combining living space, you know, repopulating places like the Northern Quarter of Manchester, or bringing in independent retailers, of bringing in artist studios, of bringing in living spaces. And people talk about the death of the high street. I think the opposite, actually. I think it may well be the death of the um, retail landlord, or at least, you know, much less value. But actually, I think the high streets are going to see a renaissance. And what we're seeing is people shopping for their bulk stuff online. Um, and we're going to see the end to the ubiquitous uh, plastic high street with the same plastic fascias and the same chain stores and every high street. We're going to see much more independent retailers. We've already started to see this with more coffee shops and barbers and nail salons and restaurants and art galleries coming. And this will be a continuous process. And I think we'll see a much richer 
high street with butchers and bakers coming back on the high streets and actually people living and working uh, much more closely together. So I see the future as being positive. Um, you know, we're talking about a manifesto in most of our developments we're doing, we're talking about green streets, not mean streets, we're talking about places that are friendlier towards people and bikes than cars, and just rethinking about the way we design our places and it's the spaces outside the homes are more important than the homes themselves. Thanks, Tom. So, so Pat, I'm just going back to this question about the, the provision of working space and, and, and living space. Um, how, how do you go about, uh, as, as a planner, um, uh, ensuring that the right kind of, of space for people is being provided? I mean, you know, do, are you looking for more co-working uh, developments in, in, in Barking and Dagenham? Are you, looking for, are you looking for buildings that could be anything? How, how, what, what, what are you thinking uh, about? Yeah, I mean, this the is just centre? something we're just starting to look at. I think from, from residential design, we are definitely looking in terms of, you know, that active frontage or the active space at ground floor level, should that actually be rather than a retail unit and possibly a coffee shop, coffee shop and um, a workspace, community space? Can we have a joint space, which is community space, learning space, workspace, for example? You know, so things becoming much more multi use so that people who want to or, or need to work close to home can do in the same as, you know, providing that space for you know, ch children, young adults who want to study close to home and you know those sort of things so we're starting to think about that starting to think about housing design in terms of you know do you need to tweak it to make it easier to to work from home and spend more time from home and i thought it's a good point rachel's point about people's i think view of their homes probably has changed because you know certainly mine that's from spending more time there you know and um and i, I think also you know in terms of what is this opportunity where previously i think you know as Tom said, you know, great opportunity for the suburban, smaller centre. You know, people are going back to smaller shops, definitely. People are also realising that you don't need to go to Argos, a another brand. You can just get it delivered. So, and there's no need to go into Oxford Street and the crowds and things like that. You can just get, you know, the big stores and everything else delivered. So I think more of that will move online. But the things that you then don't want to buy online, whether that's clothing, whether that's, you know, foodstuffs you can then go to your your local center you know and i think that is a real positive can we design therefore in more more space can we think in terms of as planners the reconfiguration of town centers so possibly it's not a total loss of retail but it's a different retail so it's smaller retail spaces rather than big boxes for the for the big chains um you know i think there are all sorts of interesting things it's just you know this is why this discussion now is interesting because we just sort of starting to see some of those things coming to maturity in, in people's minds and starting to think about it. We're definitely thinking about, you know, should we repurpose an office block that might not be used in the future? You know, as co-working space, you know, could you do a, you know, a conversion of it, you know, part residential, part, part workspace, you know, is there the demand there in, in some of the new developments rather than saying to the, the developer, you know, put retail on the ground floor? No, you know, put some office space there. We're even thinking of, well, you know, we all need a different type of office space in the future because our office strategy, which was to cram as many people as we possibly could, hot desking into a relatively small office space with 115 people, which COVID safe now works for about 20. So we will never go back to jamming 115 in. We will want more than possibly the 20 spaces, but I think we'll want a very different space. Could we, therefore we be an occupier in a in a residential development you know so i think there are lots of interesting questions coming through you know and it's not going to be the death of the town center the death of the cbd by any stretch of the imagination but an evolution and some really different trends and, and people are now realized that you you, know, you don't have to travel to everywhere for every single meeting you might want to go to some meetings you don't have to travel into the office every day you might want to go into a different form of office you know so is it hubs and satellites for some of the big companies can i, can I ask and um, this is this is maybe a, a really naive question from my, my layman's point of view but in terms of retail rachel mentioned that um that we're going away from big brands and towards small brands so so it's about boutique brands and it's about independence and it's about new experiences and 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 and, and so on how do you source those pat if you're trying to populate a high street how do you find those guys? Because the, the, the great thing about um, all of the high streets becoming similar to each other was that it was really easy to understand who your anchor was going to be. It was either Selfridges or Debenhams or, or M&S, right? It, it, I've, never, I've never in my time working out of London had to deal with Selfridges, I'm sad to say. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it's interesting. I mean, I think Tom's point is right. This is very bad news for your traditional 
big box retail landlord or shopping centre owner. Um, I think in terms of that, you know, overused word is always curation. I think there is a role for local authorities now in curating, in inverted commas, those high streets and, you know, thinking about, you know, do we acquire more retail property so that we can say, well, this one we'll let for nothing because we want this use in it because it's interesting and exciting and creates employment or activity or whatever. Other ones will be more commercial about. Um, I think a lot of it is about providing the right space that the market wants and a changing market. So, you know, we're talking to our you know, the developer or owner of the big shopping centre in the borough. has got a planning consent for redevelopment, but it is all big boxes, which I think were envisaged for, you know, Curry, Argos, you know, House of Fraser, and people like that who don't exist anymore. Um, um, and saying to them, look, you know, this couldn't this be more of a you know, dynamic, a, a smaller type, you know, unit food market, food and beverage leisure offer, all those things which to which town centres will become. So, you know, I think there are the challenges for everyone. I think there's opportunity for local authorities to get more involved. But I don't think having a, a different multiplicity of um, operators is a problem. I mean, just look, I think it's some great local success stories in terms of, say, someone like Berkey Blenders in Leighton and Walthamstow, you know, really successful little local coffee shop, despite, you know, the fact their out main outlet was in a tube station, you know, and they've come out come out and come through the uh, the change because more people are actually out and about in those um, suburban centres. Tom, pick up on any of this wherever you like, but I'm particularly interested in the idea of the council as, as your anchor tenant in a future development. I'm, again, a naive question, but you're, you're a, a mixed-use developer, but you, you've got a, a, a residential uh, heritage. Um, are you out there looking for, for occupiers for mixed office living space? Is that, uh, and, and does permitted development play into, um, into to, to that, that process? A good example is the Royal William Yard in Plymouth. This was an old disused dockyard. Plymouth's quite a tough city. This was on the wrong side of Plymouth, and we had this vision of bringing it back to life. And actually, we approached every restaurateur in Plymouth. Not a single one would go there because it was seen as being the wrong side of town, and it was a tough town anyway. So we went about curating what we saw as a tenant mix in there. And we handpicked sort of 11 different restaurants. We had a uh, huge bunny wooden stores with a canteen come in. We've got Brasserie Saint Pierre, Wildwood, Wagon Mama, Seco, Prezzo. We've got artist studios in there. We've got artist workshops. We partner with a whole series of outdoor theater, with craft markets, with um, specialist antique markets, um, a whole series of events and circus events. And it's just curating um, a, a program and a set of retailers the turn of place that nobody wants to go to, to the must come, must visit place in Plymouth. So I think you can do it. And I think it's all about having the connections. It's all about having the skills. Are local authorities the best people to curate interesting places? I mean, maybe with Pat, you've got the exception, but in my experience, most local authorities know you actually need your know, entrepreneurial. Um, I mean, a great example is Altrincham which was decimated by the opening of the Trafford Centre just outside Manchester, grew a death despite being a very wealthy area, and his resurgence has really been driven by an ex-colleague of ours, Nick Johnson, who's opened up the Altering Market and a food market in there that's transformed the town into being successful and seen lots of other things happen. So I think it's, a, it's the local authorities are there about picking partners to work with. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. And Rachel, I know you wanted to pick up on, on the retail uh, point. Just briefly, I was. We've been talking quite a lot recently about pop-ups, and obviously, pop-ups are nothing new. But I think they could have a place in both keeping city centres alive and suburbs as well for trialing out the new kind of brands or independent shops that are going to stick. And I think um, with seeing this kind of online boom happen, we've you know everyone ordering lots more from Amazon. So in that sense, big brands are obviously doing really well you might go and get your meat or whatever from a local butcher but you might get your light bulbs from amazon because it's easier um pop-ups offer an opportunity for big brands to do something smaller and more localized so therefore seem seeming like a less you know uh, foreign brand but they also offer an opportunity for you know the smaller independents to trial out retail space with less um financial commitment and i can imagine that being kind of a, a more prominent feature on high streets whether it's in the suburb or the city center that you see kind of rotating selections of shops yeah there, there are operators like souk now aren't there where, where you, you you can literally uh, hire a space for for a couple of hours and turn it into a shop a cinema a performance space and then 
two hours later, it's something completely different. So I guess I guess more of that. Carl, um, I just want to pick up on one of the other threads, which was around co-working. Um, what, what, what does your data say about people's willingness and, and, and happiness and eagerness to be co-working? Yeah, we don't actually measure co-working spaces uh, uh, traditionally, um, but it's becoming obviously uh, highlighted a lot more now. And um, um, yeah, there's a number of our, our clients that are sort of looking at the uh, figuring out what that what that third space, whether it be um, you know types of environments we just discussed, maybe going to a coffee shop, a library, maybe it, but then also this sort of more um, the hub and spoke model, as, as someone mentioned just now. You know, having these satellite offices around. Um, you know, an interesting example I was just thinking of just as you're talking about the, the retail high street is some of the some of the big global banks are actually who or retail banks are actually even looking at their, you know, their, their high street local branches and looking at how those can be repurposed potentially for this hub and spoke model. Right. So instead of bringing all your employees into the city center, could the top floor of your, you know, your Santander or your HSBC be re repurposed to to actually have. Um, you know, some shared offices there for the employees that are, and, and it's, you know, digitally um, secure as well, potentially within the, the, the sort of bank's intranet. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole host of uh, ideas and, and things flying around right now. Um, we, we are looking, we are, you know, looking at that, at that co-working environment a bit more. I mean, we as a company utilize the, those spaces ourselves. So um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's becoming part of the conversation definitely. And I think, you know, even some of the big, uh, a big um, companies we're working with are even starting to consider some of the, the parts of their buildings to be shared spaces as well, you know, to, to repurpose that, that corporate real estate, which they, which they, they own and they, and they can't necessarily shed in the, in the near term. I, I had a conversation this week with, um, with someone about uh, schools, about school buildings and how uh, actually class sizes have, have started to shrink uh, and there's, there's available space in schools. And um, there are also uh, moves to, uh, harness uh, young people who are going uh, being uh, distracted and, and pulled into a sort of uh, life of, of, of crime and violence uh, in inner cities um, but harnessing some of their skills you know the entrepreneurship that they show that uh, the, 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 their social skills and, and their ability to, to use um, online media and social channels uh, and um, actually creating entrepreneur hubs in schools using some of that space for school leavers to, to start up businesses in. Um, so, so repurposing school space as uh, as business hubs, even um, Mike. I wonder about this uh, the, the question of infrastructure in all of this. There's always this kind of chicken and egg question, isn't it? What, what do, does the infrastructure need to change in order to to provide um, the space for some of these things to happen, or or is it going to change in in response? Uh, when we're designing new schemes, um, we're putting it in right from the get go. So when we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about probably less road space, probably more active travel space. But in town centres, for instance, we're also talking about management systems such as mobility hubs, micro consolidation centres for your Amazon parcels, um, e-bike hire. Um, actually, uh, third places, we're designing third places into our town centres uh, in, to actually generate footfall on the understanding that the retail in its own right doesn't necessarily do that any longer. So um, new, new settlements, design it in from the get-go. Um, existing um, settlements, you're talking about resilience now, uh, and actually we're talking about reallocation of road space, for instance, so that you make better use of the space that you've got, something I think Tom was talking about earlier, rather than just setting it aside for one particular function, which is driving cars. So yeah, let's do it both ways. Great stuff. Okay, Pat, um, uh, we, we've got one final question, which is the, the most popular question in, in, in our poll. So I'm going to put I'm going to put that to you. But I'd also like you to to pick up on any of these threads. And also, if you could say, you know, if there were three things that were that were being presented to you over the next sort of 12, 18 months by um, third parties, by developers, by investors, by architects and designers, by, by advisors, what were the three what would the three things be that you most like to see coming forward? That's an interesting one, isn't it? I think I would like to see someone coming to us and saying, you know, we want to establish a, a model of workspace um, which could sit in a suburban town centre and possibly have a multitude of users. Effectively, some of the space could be allocated for local, local use. Some of it could be you know, a number of corporates who have this as their drop-in space, just as you know, mentioned about people using their branch of their particular bank you know if they work for a bank they can go to the local branch to work from rather than going into the head office i would like to see a model like that come forward i would like to see someone coming forward 
saying, look, I want to, you know, read, take forward a new model of retail development in a town centre, which is much more based around smaller occupiers rather than big box occupiers, which I will curate. And Tom's absolutely right. You know, what I would love to happen is for somebody, you know, come forward and say, look, I want to invest in Barking Town Centre. And I really want to really curate the, the retail space rather than be a conventional retail landlord who just looks on the strength of the covenant of, uh, you know, Mike Ashley or whoever it might be. So, you know, and on the transport side, I think, you know, I, I think we've got to, and we're starting to evolve our own approach to you know, neighbourhood streets, to quieter streets, things like that, which is a very Barking Dagenham approach rather than the approach that's gone on elsewhere. And I think it's continued pressure on that. You know, we have got to wean ourselves off the car, but at the same time, we've got to accept that, you know, people aren't going to want to use public transport in the same way potentially in the future so we are going to have to become more of the 15 minute city so i think it's that you know view of you know um, the use of road space and continuing to start to you know quieter streets and that sort of development i think we're starting to get the model where you can use technology to police and enforce some of that which i think starts to change behaviors more than possibly some of the physical measures Great stuff, Pat. Thanks a lot. And there, there you go, viewers. There's, there's an open invitation to, um, to, to send in your proposals and, and, and ideas uh, to be first. Um, but before we, before we leave, the question uh, that the viewers want uh, us to ask you uh, more than any other, um, Pat, um, is you say the office isn't dead. Uh, in light of, of everything that we've heard in, in the last hour, um, how sure are you that we're not uh, designing to accommodate lockdown rather than designing space for, for post-lockdown, post-COVID? Um, I, I just think we will see some real changes in behaviour, to be honest. It's like any significant event, yet yeah, it won't stay as we are. And we're not, you know, no one will design for, for the current arrangements. But people's attitude um, will change to certain things. It's, you know, it's happening. If you think any significant event has significantly shifted behaviour, whether it's major wars, whether it's other pandemics, you know, all these sort of things. So I think we will see a change in how people approach work, you know, and it won't be stay as we are now everyone working from home but i think people will make different investment decisions there are a lot of people now who, you know the people who i've heard previously i would never let my staff work from home we're all going now oh, we could do it with a lot smaller office couldn't we because it would be a lot less expensive and my my bonus would be bigger as a result so you know that's changed you know rapidly changed and people won't put that away again and think oh yes i'll let everyone back into my you know 450 pound a square foot office in central london i might dispatch them somewhere cheaper or make some of them work from home which is the interesting thing that is definitely happening so there will be change you know Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Pat. And thanks, Darren Nathan, for that, that question. Right. 78% of our viewers are saying that this session has positively influenced their views of Barking and Dagenham. So uh, so that's a plus. Um, well, that's but... even with me on it as well. So that must be, uh... <laughs> uh, that must be uh, extra kudos to your fellow panellists then, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> but our hour our, our is uh, up. Our hour is up. Um, so viewers, stick around for uh, just a couple of minutes longer. We've got a great little video uh, to show you, thanks to um, Tom Bloxham at Urban Splash. Um, but um, we've got to call the discussion to an end, I'm afraid. Uh, it's a real shame as it's got real legs. We've got ooh, 11 questions still hanging and I'm going to um, uh, put the questions to our panel by, by email and ask their uh, forgiveness for using up even more of their time, but request them to, to answer by email and we'll circulate um, their responses to you uh, via LinkedIn. Um, through the Voice of Authority Members Club. Um, but um, to my mind, after all of this, you know, we're still living in a, in a great, uh, a time of great uncertainty. It's really difficult to predict what's going to happen, but uh, it's, I'm a lot clearer about the direction of travel um, after, after listening to, to our panellists today, and a lot more excited about the possibilities of, of actually improving lives uh, as we come out of, of the pandemic, hopefully next year. Uh, and, and that's all thanks to, to our wonderful panel. Uh, so viewers, please join me in saying thank you to uh, Tom Bloxham, uh, MBE of Urban Splash, and thank you to Carl De Bruin of Leesman, and thank you to Pat Hayes, at B First, and thank you uh, to Rachel Rapp at Crowd DNA, and thank you, uh, Mike Axon of Vectos, uh, both for your excellent contribution to the conversation and also for your kind sponsorship that made this event 
possible. And viewers, thank you uh, out there in Zoom land for your intelligent and insightful questions and, and most of all for your attention uh, for joining us when you've got so many calls on your time. It's been a pleasure to spend the last hour with you. If you want to revisit any of this session in particular to look at some of Mike's slides that flashed by uh, in, in split seconds, um, then um, you'll be able to find a video of this session on www.sitematch365.com uh, shortly uh, to share with your colleagues and watch yourselves. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in future Sitematch 365 sessions, then please email me, uh, toby at threefox.co.uk. And there's just time to remind you, I'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. on our sister channel, The Voice of Authority, with architect Pitman Toza and guests from TfL Brent and Merton Councils to look at 4K studies of unlocking railway land for new homes. You can register for that at thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. And we'll go to the video now. Uh, thanks to Tom, Tom Bloxham very much for, for this. Um, and in the meantime, from Vectos, uh, from our Barking and Dagenham panel, from me and from everyone at 3Fox, good afternoon. <laughs>